It's the Comedy Insider Podcast. This is Scott Dickers. My guest today is Kelly Leonard, president of The Second City. Kelly, maybe start with how you got involved with Second City. Oh, uh, Second City was my first job out of college. Um, I, I'm like the only kid in America who went to his dad and said, I want to get into theater. And my dad said, finally, one of my children wants to get into theater. I'm the youngest of six boys. Everyone else went into fields like architecture or the stock exchange. Uh, but my dad, who was a TV and radio guy for years here in Chicago, had started out being an actor and loved uh, the stage. And uh, I want to be a playwright. And so he was able to set up a couple informational interviews. I met with Rock Schulfer at the Goodman, um, who basically said the advice to me, which is, if you want to work uh, in, in a theater, work in a theater, get a job whether it's tearing tickets, whatever. Um, but he didn't have a job for me. Uh, and then I met with Bernie Sollins, who had owned Second City, sold it a few years earlier, and was starting a new theater called the Willow Street Carnival. Bernie hired me. Bernie said, I'll make you a production assistant. Uh, it starts in like six months. Um, meanwhile, I'll get you a job at Second City called Joyce Sloan. So Let me back I, you up just one second. Yeah. How did you qualify for a job as a production assistant at that I point? didn't. Ber- Ber- I didn't. This is classic Second City. My, my friend Allison Riley, uh, who was the woman that I uh, was told to meet with when I came here at Second City, still here. Uh, Allison has a phrase, at Second City, two wrongs make a tradition. Uh, there, there's, that, that school of thought was, I walked in at a convenient time. Um, uh, Bernie liked my lineage, and he needed some cheap help. Uh, so I got lucky. Yeah. And then when I called Joyce, she was real mean to me when I called on the phone until I said who my dad was. And then she's like, oh, I love your dad. Sure. Show up, talk to Allison Riley, come on a Friday night. So I showed up here and and Allison walked me back to the kitchen and I was a dishwasher at Second City. This is 1988. Um, Mike Myers and Bonnie Hunt were on the main stage. Jane Lynch was in the cast in the ETC. Chris Farley was in the touring company, that kind of crew. Uh, And I washed some dishes. I then sat the room. Uh, and I did that for a few months, g- getting ice and seating patrons and, and uh, cleaning up puke, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> very, very, very glamorous. Cast puke or customer? No, customer puke. Okay. I didn't ever have to, I never had to cl- uh, clean up. Someone did, I'm sure, cast uh-huh. throwing up. And and you bring up an interesting point because in those days, in 1988, Second City was still um, uh, living in the mystique of the Belushi era. Drugs, uh, drinking, um, and that was staff, that was cast. Um, it was run very bohemian-like. So from what I understand yeah. of Second City history, Del Close was kind of the inspiration for a lot of that drug experiment, it, other than just the overall 60s I, I, drug D- culture. Del is probably but... the, the uh, most well-known of the practitioners, but I no, it was, it was, I mean, it, it, you know. Didn't he, necessarily they were all No, he, I mean, you know, the, the, Del, who was actually, when I was seating the room uh del was directing the show and part of my job was to be del's host so if del needed something i was the one uh well here's what i did we have a bench on the side where the producers normally sit or people are understudies del wanted it clear he wanted no one on that bench except for him when he wanted to sit there so my job was to keep the bench clear del liked to leave the theater during the show that he should be watching and giving notes on to go have coffee or to pluck the rubber band that was around his wrist that kept him from drinking hmm. uh, and uh, and smoking. He, he smoked then. Uh, so I'd go get him. He'd be like, go get me when the scene goes up and bring him in. Um, so, but, but Dell built mythology around him and uh, others rebuilt more mythology around him. So the amount that is fabrication, the amount that is real is impossible to ascertain and kind of doesn't matter anymore. In a way, it's been yes anded through. It has been yes anded. <laughs> the, the lies have been yes anded over and over again to a beautiful proportion. That being said, the guy was amazing, and I had done my thesis on the Beat Generation and knew Dell's name from being at the acid tests and, and and other places. And I remember one time telling him that I had done my thesis on the Beats and that I had actually. Uh, um, uh, been a fan of John Clellan Holmes, who was the guy who actually coined the term Beat Generation. It wasn't Kerouac, it was Clellan Holmes. And Dell kind of nodded like, eh, he knows something. And when I got to work uh, uh, the next day, there was a package waiting for me, and it was a brown paper bag with a first edition John Clellan Holmes novel. No note, no nothing. And when I went to thank him, he wouldn't take the thank you. So, so I did that gig, 
um, until Bernie's Theater was ready to start, which was called the Willow Street Carnival. This is 89, 1989. It was written up in Time Magazine as being potentially the next second city, like a new version. And it was based on a Spanish group called the Comediantes, who were a hippie commune in Spain that did these wonderful, fantastic tales. Bernie and his wife Jane, for the previous decade, had built a thing uh, that happened every four years called the International Theater Festival, where they brought over scads of international theater companies to perform. It was wonderful. Never made any money. Probably lost people millions. And the comedians had come over, and he'd been enamored with them. So he brought a group of actors and improvisers to go live with them to develop the show. Um, unfortunately, like I, I, there's probably many reasons it didn't work. Um, they didn't have enough money. They never tr truly fully committed to the idea. Um, I'll give you the best example. Uh, the The show was about the seasons, and the first show was going to be about spring. Uh, but Bernie wanted to open the show with the entire theater, uh, with it snowing in the entire theater. Great idea. <laughs> Cut to opening night, and all we could afford was me shaking a paint can that is over, you know, hanging over the stage in a single spotlight. So awkward. <laughs> paper coming down it's i mean like, it was just yeah it, it, the lack of spectacle was astounding in a show that was really its only difference from kind of second city was that it was supposed to be spectacle people around here called it second city with hats but that was the different difference um uh it did not work it closed <laughs> tragically i mean we started getting our paychecks written personally by the real estate guy who was hanging around on wow. from his checkbook I, I, I actually quit a week before it folded. Be, and I remember I, I had consulted everyone because, we you know, this group of people, by the way, who I'm still friends with, it's like you're in Nam with them. You, you have an ever, you know, interesting bond. Um, a, a really pampered Nam. Let me actually say that. <laughs> Terrible uh, metaphor, given, you know, what was going on. Right. Uh, but uh, um, uh, they had all said, like, go back to Second City. And I came back here, and that's when I started in the box office. And essentially, that's when my journey started to, you know, start to I – I was still writing plays, but I started getting promoted at Second City and becoming more interested in the business. And so gradually, over a period of time, I started moving out of playwright to producer um, basically over the next three years. Now, back us up on Bernie Stalins. Now, yeah. he, he was one of the original founders of the Compass Players or Second City? or Bernie was a founder of uh, Second City and Playwrights Theater Club. Um, uh, he was certainly around the Compass, but I don't think he's credited as a founder. I might be mistaken, but I don't think that's the case. David Shepard was the founder of the Compass. And he's recently left us. Bernie. Bernie. Yeah, Bernie passed away a couple um, years ago. But did you guys cross paths again once you came back to Second City? Was he part of kind of the Second City community? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I was really blessed in, in that um, when I came in, I had established relationships with uh, Bernie Solins and Del Close and Joyce Sloan and Sheldon Patinkin, all of whom, the, the, and, and then Fred Kaz, basically the, the pe people who were around either at the very beginning or, or near the very beginning um, who maintained a decades-long relationship, whether they were actively involved. I mean, Sh Sheldon had moved to New York for a few years and many years, like seven years, and didn't participate, but then he came back. Ber Bernie... Although he had sold Second City, he was constantly here, you know, whether it was giving workshops or some sort of side project. And, you know, what what happens with the Second City family is once you're sort of in, you're you're in and you're drawn into things that you don't want to be drawn into. And it's that's just the case. And and sometimes it's great and sometimes it's not. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, he he uh, uh, Bernie was a, a, a very important figure um, and so much of his personality guided Second City in, in this, the, 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 the best way I can describe it is Bernie was an intellectual. Um, he knew all the great works. He could play beautiful classical piano, and he loved to tell the worst jokes. So that combination is so Second City, the, this idea of just loving puns, uh, but also, you know, being able to quote Shakespeare and finding the, the sort of clash of those two is at the heart of any second, good Second City review. Hmm. The, the the highbrow and the lowbrow. Highbrow and the lowbrow. Yeah. Okay, so you're at the box office. Yeah. Starting up at Second City. What's the theater like? What's the business like? Second City as a thing? Is it, is oh, it kind of a culture or does it have any kind of oh, it's, business it, acumen or organization at that point? Oh, no. It, it was it was, it was was a thriving mess. Uh, you know, the, the shows were all great and sold out. 
Um, I, I, you know, the shows weren't great. Uh, the shows were sold out. The shows had amazing talent. Um, we were not breaking ground artistically, and that was pretty well known. Um, but the talent was amazing, and, like, the improv sets were crazy good. And, like, Tom Hanks would come by and improvise, like, three or four nights in a row when he was here doing a film. Wow. And, that and was it, was just, a, it was the thing to see in It Chicago. was the thing to see. But, but all the critics were like, it's a tourist trap. Um, and then as a business, literally, so the box office area – and there were, it, which still exists today. There was a few offices to the side. That was it. That was the, the that was the business. And you know the 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 we were a cash business back then. So you know we just had tons of cash we'd be putting into um, a safe. There was massive theft going on. Massive theft. By whom? Everyone. Everyone was stealing. So it was more like a pot, like a honey pot. It was a honey safe. pot. And <laughs> yeah. like, so, so an example would be like, you know, um, I'm not going to name names, but people in charge would be like, oh, do you want to go to the Cubs game? I've got a couple tickets. And be like, oh, that'd be great, but I have to work the shift. Don't worry. Um, here, have this money out of the safe to buy yourself some beers. Go, go to the game. You're like, oh, this is great. This is amazing. Oh, you're sending me the game so you can steal money from the box office that night. I got it. Okay. And I actually didn't figure that out till a few years ago. Wow. So, so it was a mess. Um, but, but, but very renowned and successful. Um, and gradually as I was working in the box office, which is a great fulcrum with which to observe an entire business, um, it dawned on me that we could be doing things a little bit better that would aid everyone. So what if we took credit cards? What if instead of taking um, uh, phone messages off a machine for reservations, we got a sequencing machine that would organize the phone calls in the order in which they came? That little, you know, I, I don't, I never thought of myself as a business person. I had no experience. I mean, I ran a video store uh, uh, when I was younger. Um, so I guess I had some experience there. But there were very little things that I was allowed to start to institute. Um, that started to have a bit of an effect. More like just practical common sense. Yeah, about how real to practical stuff. The mess. Yeah, and um, uh, and I was building relationships with talent, and I, and I was still writing and, and all that. Um, You're trying to write plays. I was writing plays. I wanted to be a playwright. I was not interested in sketch at that point. Um, and Sheldon Patinkin, who was uh, uh, while not a co-founder, was here at the very beginning and, and a renowned uh, uh, director and teacher who we also recently lost. Sheldon would give me notes on my plays. I mean, this is how cool this was. Like a a ma- the guy who Mike Nichols would fly in to note his plays immediately was like handwritten notes all through my play. I submitted to the National Jewish Theater. I submitted to Steppenwolf, and I came close. I was like in third place in two different festivals. Um, uh, so I felt pretty good about that. Uh, what happens uh, during that period, and this is now you know the early '90s, is Andrew Alexander, who had bought Second City in the mid '80s from Bernie Solins, and had been running um, our LA operation, and then that closed, and he was concentrating on TV business with SCTV, which he had created. Yeah. Um, that stuff had all dried up, and he was moving back to Chicago. And we were all told, like, go find jobs. This guy's going to ruin Second City. So I literally went to go interview with Evie McGee at uh, Remains Theater. Almost took the marketing job there. I had known Evie because she was dating a friend of mine, Stephen Colbert. And uh, she is now Evie Colbert. Um, and I didn't take it. I stayed. Andrew showed up. And it really was a matter of weeks before I'm like, this guy is no threat at all. What are people thinking? He is a polite Canadian man who really loves the work and is looking at his business and going, oh my God, what is happening down here? Um, and uh, we, by that time, I, I had assumed a title of director of sales for Second City. It was a new position that never existed before. What were you selling? Uh, Tickets I, to shows? Yeah, so okay. what I was doing was they had never marketed um, anything. Uh, it, there was no brochure for Second City. So that it was, was all one thing word of mouth and yeah. brand yeah. Uh, awareness. And at that point, while we were doing really well, we weren't selling out the Friday show at 11, you know, but it was everyone's like, yeah, you're never going to sell that out. So I got a brochure. I made a poster. I started talking to concierges, just stuff. Basic stuff. Basic stuff. And it had an effect. Of course it would. This is monkey nuts. This is easy stuff. Um, my entire career is right place, right time. Uh, so that had effect. Um, and Andrew uh, and I would go to lunch every day and he'd always have the same thing 
He'd always have a chicken sandwich. Um, Nancy Walls, um, now Nancy Carell, was a waitress at the last act. She was our waitress every day. And um, Andrew would always order his chicken sandwich. I'd get something different. And one day, Andrew, I'll never forget this, Andrew's like, Nancy, I'm going to have a Cobb salad. And Nancy takes a beat and goes, dear diary. <laughs> and it was so funny. And literally hired Nancy. We hired Nancy like two weeks later. She's got such an idiosyncratic sense she's of She's real funny. It's too bad she doesn't do as much work. I mean, because she is funny. I'm sure she's working hard as a mom. <laughs> yeah, she's working tremendously hard as a mom. And she, she'll pop up on stuff now and again. Yeah. Um, she's such a great person, too. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, and then Andrew and I would have these conversations because what, what I was now, I, I was now immersed in the community. I was going to Improv Olympic a lot. Um, I was going to The Annoyance a lot. Um, there was new long form sketch groups like Jazz Freddy that I just loved. Um, and we weren't hiring these people. When you say you were going, you were going to see the shows? Yeah. Okay. I was just, you know, I was out and about. You know, when, when you're a young person in this community, there is, you are up till two in the morning. You, you are seeing shows, you're going out afterwards, you have all this energy that I don't have anymore. Um, uh, you're unrestricted by, you know, children and, and mortgages and things like that. Right. You're just part of this very vibrant it's comedy. It's a community. huge comedy scene. And Second City had a bad rep. And I could start to see why. Because I was like, man, we are missing the boat. D Dell was here and he, Dell sort of forced Farley and Tim Meadows and P David Pasquese into the system. Um, thank God he did. Those guys were brilliant. But there was more behind him. So, um, uh October of 1992, September, October of 1992, Andrew called me into his office and said, um, I'd like you to take a more executive position at the Second City. I want you to be a, a producer, specifically associate producer of Second City. And Joy Sloan had been the producer of Second City and was a god, goddess. And I'm like, what's up with Joyce? Joyce had had a series of health issues, pretty significant heart attack strokes. And was not available to us for a fairly significant period of time, and the health didn't look very good. And for background on her, she yeah. was very much a motherly figure. Joyce was, Second yeah. City. So when Bernie uh, sold Second City to Andrew, uh, the story is he didn't tell Joyce. And Joyce was not happy about it for obvious reasons. Um, Andrew was like, Joyce, I'm going to make you a part owner. You've got a job for life, which was essentially the case. But she was not happy about it. So she was never, she was, she couldn't be angry at Bernie, so instead she was angry at Andrew. So it was dysfunctional. The scene was dysfunctional. And I did not know any better because, frankly, had I known what was about to happen, I never would have taken the job. Because it was, you know, Joyce gave me her blessing and basically said to me, if you don't take it, it's going to be someone I don't know or love. And 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 I was very much one of Joyce's kids, you know. Um, and um, But even with that, uh, the attempt to then come in and be, you know, a tw I was 26 I was a dishwasher and with no experience. And I was friends well, with a bunch of these people. Of sales. I've been director of sales. See, there was a stepping stone there in was, there. I guess there was a small. But, but, but that, believe me, that didn't come up. All that was said was a dishwasher. The dishwasher, producer. yeah. And, and it was really hard. Um, the lucky thing is my very first cast had Amy Sedaris, Paul Donello, Steve Carell, and Stephen Colbert. And the first group... Or in the first two years, I hired Tina Fey, Rachel Dratch, Adam McKay, Horatio Sands, Neil Flynn, Kevin Dorff. I mean, a, quite a, a stroke a, of luck. Yes, yes. David Koechner, a huge, massive group of great people um, who made me look very, very good by the time they got on stage. Um, but it wasn't just, you know, the it's a fallacy to think that I did really the bulk of this i didn't um you know when we hold auditions there's like 15 of us in a room and um when uh the growth the second city experienced uh was not only um uh, these great talented people come in and do the work but uh other individuals on staff who were given the jobs to grow the training center and the corporate communications division and all the different stuff that we do here and it all worked um you know we we had plenty of room there was plenty of blue sky and i think that that wasn't clear to people um, uh, and the other thing that wasn't clear to people was that they had the freedom to experiment on stage. You, you'd think because that gets taught, you'd think because it's in the books that you wouldn't need to say it all the time. Here's the thing I've learned over 27 years at Second City is you can never stop saying it because once someone gets on a stage, a little bit of fear 
creeps in that maybe they're going to fuck it up. So they might just not make the bold choice. You have to not just tell them that they need to make the bold choice. You need to model bold choices for them. So that can mean setting up models at the theater where they have nights where they have to experiment, where they have to offend. That can mean um, uh, regular check-ins with executives to have them re-say that in front of them. Um, that means when you fail as an executive, they need to hear you apologize and show them that it's okay, that failure happened and everyone m made it out okay. Um, that doesn't end. It went, when, and, and it's very easy to work at a place that is very successful to think we all got this. But, but the reality, especially at a place that, like Second City, which while many of us have worked here a long period of time, the talent never does. The talent goes. They're here for a short period of time. And that is a brilliant model, but it also requires you to start over, you know, every few months. Um, and that's a, re that's a fairly recently learned lesson for me. Yeah, but at the time, that was your first stint as producer, and this is your first cast yeah. that's coming through. But you just intuited that you have to keep repeating these messages? No, I, lear I learned that learned later. That after the, yeah, uh, I mean, it was, it, for, for that group, it was part of the mantra because they were all people who never thought they'd work here. So they came in with change. Um, and, you know, many of the books that have been written talk about this. And I remember Kevin Dorff sort of saying, you know, we didn't have time to worry about the things that Kelly needed to worry about. We were young men who only had a finite period of time. So we, we needed change and we needed it now. Um, and uh, uh, he was right. So th there was a lot of pushing um, uh, fr from those guys. and Against uh, against tradition? Or tradition. Against the business um, staff? Or? Uh, again, that, no, they didn't give a... They no one care. gave a shit about business. They, okay. It was not their concern. And, and uh, happily, um, we were not beholden to budgets in those days. I, I would um, say that had we been the organized business we are now, the massive cultural artistic change that happened in the mid-90s never would have happened. Because when we did a show called Pinata Full of Bees, which is commonly recognized in this, like 1995 as being the show that sort of busted open the doors. Very good um, show. Very good show. Um, it was a tragically uh, terrible selling show to, to the point that we were probably losing money at a certain point, but no one was noticing. And uh, uh, so we were, we were given a, a place to, to fail without eyes. Um, and, and a certain kind of concern. And, and I don't, that's not entirely true in the sense that I know Andrew was reading the financial statements, but um, other parts of the business were starting to do well. And it was like, okay, you know, th th this, and, and we all, we knew the glow was important that we had received in light of that show. Uh, Mick Napier, who had left the theater when Joyce uh, was no longer producer, came back and directed the next two shows after that. So, and those were huge successes. So, it all worked, um, but it was it was the um, it was the mistakes and the failures and the lack of oversight uh, and the chaos that allowed um, the brilliance to happen. Well, uh, that's a key point because the whole culture of Second City is is the culture of how they perform the yes and culture, yeah. and it seems that whether you were aware of it or not, or whether you guided it or not when you first came in as a producer, that culture pervaded every part of the business. Yeah. So people intuitively learned from their mistakes and yes, anded them and were able to evolve and improve and adapt and adopt. Yeah, that, that's, that's the thing. So, so a key ingredient, if, um, if you have a very strong um, culture, um, if you have uh, um, ethics um, and ethos that is ingrained in the people who work there. And we, we did have that. Um, you can almost do anything. Um, uh, we were lucky in that we had a base to work from, right? We were already very popular, all that stuff. But, but really, and, and you're right, I, I probably couldn't articulate those ideas till many years later, uh, but it didn't matter because I had now grown up in it. Yep. Um, and I lived it on a day-to-day -day level. Um, and I had very good advice and support of the players around me because part of the rule of Second City is to make your partner look good. And, you know, people could be mad with me or, you know, upset with certain kinds of decisions, but almost everyone would get over it or be like, okay, I, you know, whatever, this, I don't agree with this, but I'm going to yes and. Um, and, and vice versa. So, you know, that's the one thing we, we – 
it's funny, you know, at the age that our business is now, we're 56 years old, um, and, and we're successful and we're bigger. We have a lot of conversations be, uh, around um, uh, the corporate culture and, you know, where it stands and because it's very important. We never want to lose that. And I was just in a meeting recently where I said, here's the odd thing, guys, is the one thing I don't think we need help with is that. I think what every other business, many, many other businesses uh, need to tend to is the kind of the one thing that we're all universally like pretty on the same page about. And that 20% that we're not on the same page about is awesome because that 20% is the shit that just fuels cool discussion and something new. It's like we can, if we're 100% on the same page, uninteresting. Then you're a cult. You're a cult. Exactly. So this this not knowing percentage, um, even though it probably drives some of us batty because we're like, well, that person doesn't do this or this person doesn't think that. It doesn't matter. Essentially, and this is how I know this. The reason I know this is this community is the best when everything goes haywire. So we've experienced so many deaths in the last five years, personally, professionally. We, we've lost everyone. I've lost both my parents. We lost the founders of the theater. and We lost young people. We lost brilliant minds. At every single turn, we came together as a group to support each other, the, the, the widows or, or the sons and daughters, whoever was affected by this. We held memorials that were beautiful. Um, we, we celebrated our community and, and found strength through the, these kinds of losses. And that's, that's the stuff that only happens when y- you have what is most important at heart, um, when everything else can be sort of shoved aside. Um, uh, I remember when my brother-in-law passed away, uh, David, um, uh, Andrew was supposed to be at some place important, and he flew back just to be here. This is my wife's, and my wife Anne works here as a very important figure at the theater. Um, her brother, he didn't know him well, met him a couple times. There was just not even, it wasn't even a question. He was just there and was like, oh, okay. So as mad as I'll get with him or he'll with me or whatever, you know, and that happens because we it's a business and, you know, um, that stuff you never have to worry about. So um, that's a total gift. The, the, the corollary to that for early in my career is that I never had to worry about ticket sales. So every other person who runs a theater, that's all they think about. That is all they think about. Think of marketing. How do I get people in the door? I never once had to worry about that. So even though I did this director of marketing thing, it's not like we had a big ticket problem. You know, we were running at probably 80% capacity and I might have got us to 84% capacity. And that was because the community was so strong. People Everyone came here. supported the- You could take a shit came. on stage and they come here. I mean, it's, it was yeah. just true. Yeah. So then when the work got better, you know, then it's like through the roof. But that meant that my point of focus could always be, you know, things like the best talent, new ideas for expressing the art, new business lines that we could get into. You know, the, the, the thing that would occupy any other producer 85 to 90% of the time, I didn't have to focus on really at all. Um, not so much the case now because we have so many more spaces and other kinds of businesses that I have to spend more time, but there's also more people here to do that. Right. And I definitely want to talk about those because I find those to be very interesting just in terms of how the Second City has leveraged itself as a business. Yeah. Because in comedy, so often people who get into comedy are creative and creative minded and yeah. they don't really give much thought to business or how mm-hmm. to maximize their. They have to now. Their business. They do have to now. Because, you know, we should all make a living at this. Well, and, We and, shouldn't and, just do it for fun. And Second City has just done so well with that. And you but can I, make a significant living at it now. Oh, yeah. Comedy is finally taken seriously yeah. as a, a line of work, which yep. it really never was. Right. But just more on the community and the culture, I feel yeah. like those are two different things. The community of Second City is almost mm-hmm. like a family. Like you said, yes. there's just so much love and support. Yep. And having had the pleasure of working here with you guys, I mm-hmm. feel that. And it's yeah. great. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can only get that from over half a century right. of working together yeah. and growing together. And it's, mm-hmm. it's amazing. Mm-hmm. But the culture, which, you know, in any good business, a culture is, is defined and everyone knows what it is. Mm-hmm. And there's almost no better example than Second City, maybe Zappos, which is very right. well known for their culture. Yeah. But you did an excellent job just kind of describing the culture in your book, Yes mm-hmm. And. Mm-hmm. And that's how I think of it as the culture, the mm-hmm. Yes And culture. Yep. It's one of the, if I, if I might boldly plug your book. Thank you. One of the better business books that mm-hmm. I've read. Thanks. Because the culture of Second City, the yes and culture, informs 
like we were talking about a lot of the business decisions that yeah. you guys have made. It's like, and what I, I was thinking about the whole yes and culture, and I realized it's so natural. It, it, it be, it's yes. almost beyond human behavior natural. It's like universally natural because it's the same process as evolution. Yes. Which has brought us a lot of amazing, wonderful things like giraffes and Mozart symphonies. When you apply the concept of evolution, which is random change mm -hmm. equals adopting what's successful, mm -hmm. and you apply that to a business, you almost can't fail. I'll break it down even further. Why is it radical that um, a business can grow and thrive if it is affirmative? It's a radical idea now. And, and that seems crazy because yeah. what... Are, are we saying the opposite? Are we saying that that you need to have negativity, you need to have disconnect? Uh, you know, it, it, when you read these contemporary business books that are, you know, so fascinating right now. So, like, if you go, if there's a Barnes & Noble left in America and you go there and you go to the business section, because when I was writing the book, I, I would go and look at this. It's like, oh, book on failure, a book on acceptance, a book. On, it's all our stuff, yep. you know. And the, the thing, there's what's fascinating from a comedy perspective, I think, about this culture, is it's seemingly paradoxical because so much of what we do on stage that is powerful and connects to individuals is our inherent cynicism, our railing against conventions, figures, our dirtiness, our daring to offend, our crossing the line. This is all the stuff that delights the comedy nerds. Um, and we, when we are very good second city, we're doing all those things. Um, but we do it all in a process that is the most loving and affirmative yeah. process that exists. Well, it's, a, it's an honesty that yeah. pervades, you know, on stage, it results in a lot of bold and potentially offensive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. material, but in a culture or business context, it results in just a really refreshing honesty about what's working, what's not working. Yeah. And, but the comedy world... Outside of Second City, so I'm talking specifically about stand-up, uh, but also Lampoon, and I think also The Onion, um, are very different in terms of uh, a, a – and I talked to Mar Mark Maron about this when he was here. We had a very funny conversation about it. Uh, that, you know, they, they're driven by isolation, by negativity, by saying <laughs> no, uh, by over and over again rejection. All these these things that that they that many of the I, mean, I'm, I don't want to speak on their behalf, but let me put it this way: a, a, a there has been an a, a, a image that has been created or cultivated uh, in comedy circles um, that uh, the path to that success um, uh, is not one of affirmative love. Yeah, and I you know I can speak authoritatively on the Onion's behalf. Mm -hmm that our culture is very much a no-but culture yeah. and always has been. It's mm -hmm. very much about finding what doesn't work mm -hmm. and making sure that when everybody's excited about an idea, a comedy idea, really focusing on, well, is it really funny? Mm -hmm. Let's let's hear the no's really carefully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you guys just have a very it's different very process. Different. And, it's, and, and, you know, it's not that that doesn't work because I think the Onion's work is is excellent and, and um, long-standing. Um, and I think many of these stand-ups we talk about, like Marin's a genius. Absolutely. Um, but the funny thing in the, the conversation we had was he was talking about looking at the pictures on the wall and he's like, yeah, that Belushi era, you know, I mean, look, look at all these geniuses who all killed themselves. And, and the, he goes, what's, what's fascinating? He goes, I know Colbert and I know Tina and they're not that yet. They are no less geniuses. And I said, well, and, and my thing was, yes, I lived here with both those eras. And I can tell you exactly that that's true. And it doesn't mean that, that Tina and Steven don't have demons. They do. They just didn't need to crawl into the drugs to deal with them. Um, so if we're just talking about drugs, that seems silly. Yeah. <laughs> if we're, if we're just saying that it's a drug issue because we're all medicating ourselves in different ways. Of course. You know, and, and some do it with food or, or, you know, psychotropic drugs or whatever, Ritalin, you know, but that, that is silly to think that that is somehow crucial to, to the uh, component here. And I grew up, I mean, you probably did too. I did my thesis on the beat generation and I was a deadhead. I, d you know, I definitely thought, and I read Huxley. I thought that my drug use was a passage. I don't anymore. And I look at my kids and I look at the, the people that I find who are geniuses right now and they don't use. Yeah, well, what I see that as is an example of the evolution, the yes and yeah. culture. It's like we learned from those mistakes. Yeah. You know, people like Tina Fey learned from people mm -hmm. like John Belushi. 
maybe and this Del Close. Is, maybe this is not Who's the route to go. Yeah, no. yeah, no, no, no. That's that's actually yes. That it's so so when you have a yes and culture, um, you can uh, change behaviors without um, changing culture. Yeah, and and without affecting what's important. Um, and and it's it, you know I, I'm the the one of the things that I'm so blessed with is is having this um, seat at the time I did to watch these changes to then um, grow with the company and now be at a, a place in my career where I think I can articulate a little bit better why things are successful. And, and it's funny, just from a business point of view, to work at a place, so, so we've been around forever, right? 55, 56 years. Um, what is our expertise if you break it down right now? Our expertise is um, short form content uh, and interactive um, creative methodologies what's the world become <laughs> yeah that it's interactive short form content like who who what organization at this point in their career after all the success is now in the vanguard really for the first time yeah i mean no when we were starting out who took improv classes it was like 50 dudes in a room and now our, our training center is like 3000 plus students we're building out 25000 more square feet it's a mecca it's crazy. And, and the people who are here, the bulk of them are not looking to go on Saturday Night Live. They're not even looking to go on our stage. Right. They're coming here because they find it a, a very um, uh, affirming place to engage on a weekly basis, to play, um, uh, to meet other people, to reskill. Um, I recommend improv training to just about anybody in the comedy yeah. business because from what I've seen of it, and I've done a little bit of it mm -hmm. myself, it really gets people comfortable in their own skin. It's yoga. It's really... It's um, verbal yoga. <laughs> it, it's an amazing way to learn social mm -hmm. skills. Mm -hmm. People who have gone through the Second City program all have the, a very similar kind of improvement to their personality. Yeah. It's like the best of them has come out. They're, they're unafraid to be themselves. Mm -hmm. And they're very fluid mm -hmm. socially, mm -hmm. regardless of the comedy instruction that yeah. you might get. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing... Uh, well, it puts, you in, it puts you in practice. It puts yeah. you in practice being a human being. Yeah. And when uh, my wife, uh, who's taught here forever, described, um, she was describing an ex uh, one of the exercises for a doctor who we were talking to. And she goes, well, what we're doing here is recreating human behaviors. And a lot of times we're doing it over and over again. It happened to be that the doctor we were talking to was someone who dealt with autistic kids. And that's how we started getting into the health and wellness sphere. Because they were like, well, wait a sec. The one problem a lot of these kids have is they don't they, they that's what they're cut off from they right. they don't know how to act human can you show them how to you know act human and i remember this i i was helping oversee a radio show that we had on the loop um and the program director uh i was just talking about this and he goes i have an autistic kid he's on the spectrum and i go why don't you bring him in i'll get you i'll comp you into classes and he did that and three weeks later he stops and he came in. It was a weekend show, so he was usually not in. And he came in, tears in his eyes. And he's like, you have no idea. What happens is for an hour after his class at Second City, he's a different kid. He's everything that you'd want your kid to be. It wears off, but after he's been in practice, we, my wife and I now, we come to the class, we wait outside for him because we take advantage of that hour. So a lot of, you know, I get asked a lot, like, what's the next 50 years for Second City? If I had to point to one thing that I think is going to overwhelm in a very positive way what we do, it's going to be the health applications of improv-based training uh, for people to um, be better. That'll be fascinating to see how that mm -hmm. evolves. Uh, so I want to get into the how Second City has grown and expanded as a business because... Okay. It's an analogy for how an individual comedy person can yeah. monetize what they're doing. Yes. It's like you guys have just made great decision after great decision. And I'm sure a lot of those great decisions came from failure, yeah, which is part totally. of the culture, mm -hmm. to step into businesses that have just been such a natural and have been so lucrative. I'd love to just hear a little bit about sure. what those are, how those came about, and how they're managed. Yeah. Well, I mean, cut to what you, what you as an individual growing up in the comedy world need to do now, which is different than the world we all grew up in. So now you, you need to look at yourself as a brand. You need to understand what your point of view is, and you need to diversify because the, the, 
the reality is you can have really great success um, uh, if you are allowed to have some modicum of control over your career, which means you need to be a writer, you need to be a performer, you need to be a producer, um, a generator of your own content. You, sometimes you need to be a director. Uh, and that didn't necessarily exist before. You could just pick a channel and then people would take care of you. A blogger. Yeah, a, a blogger, yeah. So, uh, yeah, exactly. So all those things factor into not just like, oh, this is the shit I need to do to get hired onto a show. No, this is the way you are going to take your care of yourself and have influence and be, you know, um, a, a um, an important part of this industry. And make your own show, essentially, before make your own you show. get on a show. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, as a business here, what happened is, uh, you know, we, we were a live theater. Um, and all this stuff happened by accident, right? So we were a live theater, and then someone called and wanted to have like us to go perform for them. So we found some actors, and we sent them out to do a show. And then we're like, well, maybe we should have a, a company that's dedicated to doing these shows out of here. So then that was when the touring company was born in the late 60s. Um, so, so people like Bill Murray were in the touring company and John Belushi and all those guys. And they were performing at colleges and performing arts centers. Well, a couple of things happened. One, that became an actual business. So now we have three full-time touring companies. It's like a franchise Chicago. business. Yep. It's like taking the brand that you guys have built mm -hmm. and spreading it around. Spreading it around without, without franchising it, though. Uh, without putting it in someone else's hands. Right. Uh, it also served two other things. It developed talent because the the kinds of experiences that you have when you're going out and performing, not only this like classic Second City material, so you're modeling material that has been successful before, so you're learning from the greats, uh, but you are developing rapport with your comedy partners and you're developing van bits, you know, which are important. So the bits that you do, uh, the bits you do in the van with your fellow actors. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. So, you know, the, the stuff that then probably becomes part of your act. Um, uh, you, and there, it's often, it's like someone you knew in grade school. Um, uh, Dave Keckner and Brian Stack had, I forget which one of them, but it was a guy that they, one of them knew who always would try to make jokes, but then sell out his jokes at the end by saying no. So he'd be like, you know, someone would say something about a door. He's like, yeah, door hit me in the face. No. And then do this no. And it was the, it like, they would try to get, it never got in a show. But I mean, this bit was so funny. It would have us in tears. Um, uh, so that was one thing. Then the other thing that happened was because we were going and playing all these colleges and these performing arts centers is we were being evangelists for the brand. We were getting people all over the country to be aware of what Second City was. And then the college kids would maybe move here and take classes. Classes. It's like syndication is a better analogy than franchising. Yeah, yeah. Because you're you're spreading it, you're mm -hmm. growing it, and it's almost like every performance is an advertisement for yes. the brand, for the classes. And they're paying else. us for it. So so we're making money while By we're doing advertising. this. Advertising. Yeah. It's so a it's a brilliant great model. Great business model. Brilliant model. Um uh it used to be that we would have some classes around here and usually people come in and give twenty bucks to the teacher and um and we formalized the second city training center in the mid eighties. Um, simply to kind of like control that a little bit more. So right away, great. Yes, we, we, we charged more for classes. We sort of built a curriculum, all that stuff. But as we were forced to write down what it is that makes this stuff work, um, that uh, made us think about the work in more interesting intellectual ways, which then translated to transformational ideas about improving the work or changing the work. Um, uh, really, like, I remember early in my career, it was hell uh, finding good new directors because we had no system. We would just throw someone in. We have a directing program now. The, the, the success that we've had in the modern era, uh, recent modern era, is completely um, uh, due to the rigorous study that these guys get in and the access they had to people like Sheldon Patinkin and Bernie Solons to, to learn that form of directing, but then find their own voice. Yeah, there's a pipeline now. There's a pipeline now. Uh, and then we would have never have known um, how our work could inform things like health and wellness or, or how could it could inform um, uh, the elderly or kids. I mean, this is the thing. The improv games that were the basis of Viola Spolin's improv games, Improvisa Improvisation for the Theater is the name of the book, that formed the basis of the thing that became Second City. Those are children's games. So, and I remember Anne and I, um, uh, uh, where our son uh, had reached the age where he needed to do like a summer camp. So we took him to Looking Glass and he did this theater summer camp and had the best time. And we were leaving the performance and, and I go, God, Second City should do this. 
And at that point, I was in charge of the theater and Anne was in charge of the training center. And we're like, I guess that would be us who could do that. And that's when we started summer camps, which are now the biggest thing that we have going at Second City and the training center. And then the college major that Anne oversees at Columbia, same thing. So the college, the it, comedy, studies. comedy studies and then the comedy major, uh, the first ever uh, major in comedy writing and performance in the United States. Which is major. such an exciting it's program. Great. She's had me come and talk to those kids. It's amazing. Those kids are amazing, too, because they're they're getting it's the right age to be exposed to things like Bob Newhart and uh, uh, Marx Brothers and Harold Lloyd and all that. Yeah, they're really opening up their yeah. awareness, and there there's so much energy and mm-hmm. enthusiasm in those groups. It's great. I know, and they're you know they're bypassing us now, which is hilarious. They're they're headed to LA. I'm like, oh, all right, missed that. But there there's so many of them now. It's a big great program. Uh, and then the corporate area, um, which is primarily why we wrote the book initially it's a, it's it's a business book uh, that i think functions as more hopefully but that's what i was saying i think yeah. it functions as much more than just a practical business we, book we wanted it to um, but you know we started a, a group called i mean it first called the second city comedy marketing group then it was second city communications now it's called second city works but the premise is um, we have a division here that works with uh, businesses um, leveraging our improv methodologies as a training tool and our skill at creating content um, to give them, whether it's material that they can use to sell something or material that they can use to tee up uh, a program, an idea. Um, You know, comedy is an excellent lubricant to talk about difficult stuff. And a lot of businesses have realized that they they have difficult stuff they need to talk about. And um, while it would have seemed anathema 15 years ago to bring a comedy company to help address the merger that's gone wrong. Now people are seeing, you know, the only way we're going to get to these people is to get to something that speaks to them. And comedy is often something that speaks to everyone. So it's, it's calling out the elephant in the room that if all we do is we're brought in to call out the elephant in the room, we do it well. Um, We're well organized uh, to do that. And that has become a very big business for us. Um, All those things connect. They all, you know, stem from the same, core expertise right and they're all leveraging that core expertise yeah. so well yeah you know in a way that doesn't sell it out certainly in any way but hopefully you know, uses it to help others which is a valuable service mm-hmm. you can charge good money for it mm-hmm. it just makes such great business sense and it's things and it's things we know to be true and things we know how to how, how to do where we get in trouble often is when we start to step outside that circle right well it's what you said before about how important it is to create a brand Mm -hmm. because once you have a brand and a point of view then you can leverage that yes once people understand that Mm -hmm. you can kind of put it in a box yep which is so valuable in this day and age yeah yeah because it it, because you know it's increasingly hard to stand out in a crowd you start to look at you know so summer in chicago uh for anyone who's not from here um it is there is a festival on every street every week it's and it's great for 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 someone who lives in the city. It's so cool. Like I, I literally we, we we went out last weekend and I had no idea that a craft beer festival would be happening in uh, Lincoln Square. Did you see that? I it, did not. Yeah, they just set up a bunch of booths and it's all in this big field. I'm like, this is awesome. And that in like, oh, it's festival time. That didn't exist in the old days when we were here. And summer is our busiest time. We still do fine in the summer, but the amount of um, attention that we are competing for just in terms of cable TV, the internet, gaming, um, and then l- other live events, concert venues, theater venues, comedy, all that. It's its kind of staggering. It is. You're a drop in the ocean. Yeah. Unless you can really identify, like you said, a unique point of view mm-hmm. and a brand that people get, then you've kind of got something. Yeah. And so you, so for, for young you know, people honing their, their comedy career... It, the most essential thing is to make the discovery of what your comic point of view is, your POV, and then figure out how best to uh, project it. Uh, and and what are the what are the various ways you project that well? Um, are you best drawing? Great, focus on that. Do other, but make sure you're focused on your thing. And so a lot of what art we do here at Second City. Uh, in the training center and then into the touring companies, which is some, something of a training process, is to find that comic uh, POV and find different ways to display it. Um, you need to do everything. You need to act and sing and do all that. But 
um, the thing that will get you the furthest is when someone, you know, can just respond immediately to you. Like, you know, Mark Maron, like we talked about, I get, I get it. I get the comic POV. Yep. John Mulaney. I get it. That's, you know, and here's the, here's the thing with Mulaney. Um, he came, I'm, I'm seeing him on Saturday. He's coming here to do the Chicago theater, but he had done, uh, uh, two performances at our up comedy club, which is only 280 seats sold out in a minute. It, it was the best stand up concert I'd ever been to. Um, did you watch his television show? I've not. It's terrible. Hmm. I mean, terrible. Uh, and I'm sorry to my friends who produced it. I love you. It's fine. <laughs> not everything works. But it contained none of his actual. It, it was. It, they could not translate his POV to television. And it was. The thing was, they were ham fisting his stand up routine into the dialogue for the show. So let's take this routine and we'll just craft it as a scene. It didn't work. That's a, Yeah. I mean, that's a whole other conversation about yeah. how you port what you do into other media. Yep. Which is uh, kind of a whole other realm. Oh, of, yeah. It's real hard. I mean, we, we struggle with it. It's a challenge. It's different. It's different when you take your stuff from a theater venue to a TV venue to a digital venue to a film venue. They're all different. And it's not that you can't learn, and, and, and people do, but it's not easy. No, but in, in the Second City philosophy, uh, fall on your face. Yeah. Learn. You know, just if don't put too many eggs in that basket, though, so you don't mm-hmm. lose the farm. <laughs> right. So, so yeah, where you, you can't fail. Don't fail on a national television program. <laughs> right. F- fail on your website. Yeah. Have a bad tweet. Have a bad tweet when no one is following you. <laughs> Once you have millions, that gets harder. And right. it does. I mean, Gilbert Gottfried, you know, lost a lot of money because of his bad tweet. Now, he's it's... still performing and doing all that. But, I mean, that Affleck money was sweet. That's another thing that we talked about punching down. It's like yeah. before you hit send or, or whatever, you know, who is who is the victim of your joke? And if the victim of your joke is a bunch of people who just died, that is probably not a good joke it's not well crafted <laughs> exactly uh this whole idea right uh, ann and i are speaking at aspen ideas festival and they asked us to host a luncheon uh to talk about um an aspect of comedy and what we actually chose were we want to talk about um uh when it's appropriate or not appropriate to use comedy um because that's such a thing now it is such um a thing. and it for for us it's it's what people understand, first of all, is context, which is hugely important, um, but also the various rules around what makes things funny and not funny. So one of Anne's theories is you guys have all heard the uh, the term, you know, comedy is tragedy plus time. So she added one element, uh, which is it's tragedy plus time plus distance. Well, I, I do tragedy um, plus time or distance. You got it. But we, it's Anne a similar thing. Have, you guys have talked about we, it. We have talked about this stuff. Uh, and and while we're, and, and we're there might close. be some minor disagreement, but you're close. And and you know the difference there is that that time and distance are two different things, which is I think what you're sort of saying that, and 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 I think she is as well. That sometimes, um, if, if the I was not offended by the tweet, the Gilbert Godfrey tweet about you know the hurricane victims or whatever, right? Typhoon victims. Um, because I'm in America, I, I have the distance of 3000 miles, right? So it w- didn't take me five years to get over it. It took me merely being 3000 exactly. miles away. Um, and the example we use in the book is, is, uh, we, we did a bit a year after Columbine. Um, and, uh, it worked, it was great. Um, uh, until one night when this girl, uh, just lost it and ran out of the theater and she was a freshman at Northwestern cause she was a senior at Columbine. And it was a heart wrenching conversation because she was like, "You can't keep that scene in." And I'm like, I, "Yeah, we're going." And, and I go, "It's never going to be okay for you. I get it." And and that's you know, um, uh, my dog got killed uh, this year, and it was tragic and terrible. Hit by a car when I wasn't in my care. Young dog too. Um, I came to the theater a few nights later, and there was a scene about a dog being killed, and I had to leave. And I would like that scene's not coming out, and I'm okay with that stuff now. I was not then; I just couldn't. And I'm not, you know, but I work. I'm not blaming Second City, but what happens is someone who's suffering from cancer comes and seen, sees our scene on cancer, and they don't know that we work with Gilda's Club. They don't know that there's a whole theory about comedy with people with cancer. They're just upset because it hurt them. This whole conversation that people are having about when is when is the right time. It's all personal, and it's, we have our own it's issues. It's dynamic. And, you know, we obviously at The Onion have received so many letters over the years, people complaining about something being over the line yeah. or inappropriate or whatever. 
And the letters almost um, could be written from a template because yeah. they're all the same. They mm -hmm. all start with, first of all, let me say I have an excellent sense of humor. Yes. And I've enjoyed The Onion for a long time. Yep. However, this time you've gone, you, too, you've far gone too far because you made fun of X. Mm -hmm. And X is always the thing about me yeah. that I can't laugh at. It's my dead dog or it's my Columbine yeah. or whatever. And, and that's valid for them. It's totally valid for them. You know, the thing is, though, I bet you that uh, eight out of ten of those letters – it's not the person themselves who's afflicted. They are offended on someone else's behalf. Those are the worst. Those are That's the, worst. the bulk of them. And frankly, I think a lot of that was um, The Onion's tweet yeah. about Quivenzene Wallace. Yeah. A lot of people were coming to the defense of who they perceived as a poor, defenseless black yes. girl. Yep. And a lot of white liberals were coming to Of course defense. they were. Those are the, the, <laughs> oh, white liberals are the worst. The white liberals are the absolute worst. I think as a creator of satire, you've yeah. got to be aware of your bias of privilege. Yes. Almost more than what's going to push your buttons and make you and they're offended. E we had a, a bit of a knockdown drag out a couple of weeks ago because we had a big, we brought in all the directors. Beth Kligerman, who's our director of casting, brought them all in because she'd been, we're on Norwegian cruise line ships. We've got a long-term deal with them. A whole other whole business other business that you guys have. Yeah. It's been great. And, uh, but you know, you can't, you can't get away with a lot of stuff on the Norwegian cruise line ships. So we're, we're pretty safe. Not entirely. We have late night shows that can get out there. But the, ironically, the issue we were having was not with our audience. It was with our actors because we had scenes that could be perceived as the punchline was that someone was transgender. Um, and that is a sensitivity that didn't exist when a lot of this material was created. And not everyone in this room where we had this conversation agreed. They were like, F fuck you. This is, this is, this is a joke. Like it's a, you know, fish out of water. It's the same thing. Why is it now being sensitive? And, you know, I'm like, this is, this is, and some people didn't even want to have the conversation. I'm like, no, 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 we have to have the conversation. The, the ability to talk about this is, is absolutely important. Um, and, you know, I, I, what I was sort of going is like, let's examine the joke. Is the butt of the joke um, the person because they were really a man or really a woman? And is that sophisticated now? Um, it doesn't matter what it was before. It doesn't matter who did it. They thought this. The, the, the biggest thing that revolved around this is a very famous scene from Pinata Full of Bees called Gump, in which a executive played by Scott Adsit is meeting with Adam McKay, who's a HR person who reveals to him after his test that he's retarded. And he keeps using the term retarded. And this is the number one letter we get. Like if we say that word, we're going to get letters. So I'm very conscious, uh, 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 conscious of um, how are we using it? Um, and there was a recent show where we used it gratuitously. I hated it. I tried to convince the folks to take it out, and they wouldn't. They're still mad at me about it. They think I'm not defending them. I'm like, you're wrong. You you are saying it gratuitously. And everyone, I got tons of letters, and I go, I agree with you 100%. Like, take it out. I go, I don't censor my people. I can't. I can't. I'm not going to. You can pick it all you want. We don't censor, and then you don't want us to censor our people. Let's just try to convince them they're wrong. S send me a letter. I'll forward it on to them. Never worked. But, you know, creative if, people are the last people to respond to letters or, or change what they're doing based yeah. on a letter. God, and God love them for doing that. Yeah, because, you know, there are plenty of people who aren't creatives who are mm -hmm. going to be knee jerk reacting to every letter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Completely change the business. You've got to have, spi you have a spine. You've got to. Yeah. yeah you've got to fight for what's right. I mean, so where's the line for you guys at, at Second City when it comes to you don't want to punch down. Right. But at the same time, you don't want to stop doing a joke that's going to make a high school girl run out of the theater in tears. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that that the, you know, dare to offend is matched with play uh, to the top of your intelligence. So, you know, who who is the object of your satire? Um, is it being understood enough by the audience? Mick Napier is a great one for this in terms of knowing that when he would have particularly offensive pieces, he needed to protect them both in terms of where they were in the running order or little things around them. Um, so if he was saying something horrible, uh, make sure the person who everyone loves in the cast is saying the horrible thing. There's all kinds of tricks you can do um, because what 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 Mick didn't want, and and I don't think anyone really wants, is I don't want someone leaving the theater. I don't want them their entire night ruined because we felt the need to be provocative. Um, I don't mind that they're made uncomfortable. I kind of love that. Um, Book of Mormon was that right? That I means like this is. Book of Mormon was saying stuff that I'm like, I've never heard this said in the context of a musical. However, I thought they towed the line 
between those two things so beautifully. Yeah, well, so that it was right on the cusp. They mastered it. It That's, was masterful. It, it took twelve years. To well, obviously, that show. they were masters of that on South Park. Yeah, and got so good at knowing how to get right up to the precipice mm -hmm. and sometimes over and of course sometimes over but you could tell you know they knew this is again they they're mm -hmm. great at porting what they do into a different medium this is yeah. a stage it's different it's going to be a little more but i'll tell you one thing we did do so and it goes back to how we started this that uh, uh conversation but one of the things uh was that you need to reinforce with people the idea of um the ability to experiment and to to understand what this culture means and, and, and how you need to risk and fail. I felt like this is a couple of years ago or a year ago that we were getting a little safe. Like I was like, why are these choices safe? Um, and I realized that we're such a big business. Everyone sees it as a big business. We didn't have at that time important models for failure other than like the regular improv set and what we talked about. So we actually created an evening um, Tuesdays and Wednesdays in the ETC theater here, which was sometimes dark, normally dark. And it was called Death by Evening. And here's what, the, the, here's what I wanted. I said, get people to come in and they need to try to offend us. They need to try to do things that don't work, um, things that they would never think they'd see on a Second City stage. And it was amazing. We saw great characters. We saw people that we had no idea that they had this thing in them. Um, and not everything worked. That was the point. Was it marketed as this is going to be over the top? It was, it was kind of, I mean, in the way that we market that sort of thing, great it was experiment. a $10 ticket. It was a Tuesday and Wednesday in a space where we normally experiment. That's when those kinds of shows take place. And it was $10. So no one was complaining. Um, and indeed, like, you know, it was a dog one night and then another night would be amazing. Sure. But people who did that ended up on the resident stage and were doing the work. So it was, again, a reminder that it is it is the duty of the caretakers of the business and the creative business uh, that they can't stop finding uh, models that will inform the community of their role. Um, because it's not enough just to say the words. It's not enough just to say you have an open door policy. It's not enough to just have an open door. You sometimes have to go out and drag someone in through that door. Yeah, and it's also a little bit of uh, leading by following, which you talk about yeah. in the book. Letting the creative people make a mistake mm -hmm. and just learning from that and knowing that that's a valuable tool. Yeah, it's getting away from hierarchical leadership that requires that I or a director tells you what to do. Which is only going to lead to whitewashed yeah, content. Yeah, never works. And, then, and, and, and you're not going to get the best out of someone. So instead, give them the ability to, to be the leader uh, and to generate the content that they think is amazing. And then allow us to then go, oh, great. I know what package to put that in. And Absolutely. that's what the director does. And then that's what the producer does. Oh, that's how we, that's how we take your, your genius and apply it into our, our world. And so that... You know, our concept, which is based on the improv term, follow the follower, is that at any given time, leadership operates in a dynamic. And at any, any given time, I'm the boss and the person who works for me is the boss. Uh, and we need to find a way to shift uh, uh, that comfortably uh, and without ego, which means I have to be okay seating control uh, with the knowledge I'll get it back. And the problem is too many people running businesses these days feel that if they ever seat control, they'll never get it back because we all think we're frauds. And believe me, we all do. I think I'm a fraud every single day. Um, uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and the minute you realize that you can seat over control, uh, that you will get it back, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, control is an illusion. It's completely And an as illusion. soon as you realize that and give it up, it's almost like you get a form of it. Yes, exactly. You, <laughs> you, you increase your power. <laughs> exactly. You absolutely do. Because yeah. real leadership is the ability to create vision um, for others. Uh, and to get the most out of the people who work for you. And um, uh, back to earlier part of the conversation, um, uh, I have found in my experience that the model in which people work the best is when they are feeling appreciated, um, when they feel that they've got a safe place to, to operate, um, and when they know they can fail and the consequence won't be that they're fired, it will be that it's a learning place to make them better. Um, and and that, all of that only works if you hire well. Uh, and I would add to that, they also have to feel like they're in an environment where they will receive nothing but accolades for their success. Yes. And really no downside for their failure. Right. Yeah. That's, that, that is, that's the, the definition of a creative company. 
and and this again applies to an individual. It doesn't have to be a big company, yeah, a creative no, no. company. There's a microcosm here of how you manage yourself and your brand and um, your house, your kids, your own, yeah, <laughs> everything. Yeah, no, it's, you say it's no a, great, a lot to kids. It's a great philosophy for for life. Yeah, so if you can figure out how to say yes and to a kid instead of no, it's it's a it's a it's a huge difference. And and you know, I, I I will admit, you know, because my wife and I are both steeped in the second city culture, um, it comes back to bite you in the ass too. Because my <laughs> son will be like, "Oh, nice yes anding, Dad." Yeah, well, that's a whole another conversation for our parenting podcast. Yes, that'll be next. Uh, but for now, Kelly, thank you. It's been fascinating. Thanks, Scott.